Welcome to the Relational Grace Podcast, where we share the teachings of Pastor Nick Harris, who taught us that Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. I'm Jamie Russell, Pastor Harris's son. This episode wraps up our current series titled, Courage and Confrontation, which follows the life and times of Elijah. This has been a truly amazing series that has come with God's perfect timing. I hope these teachings have encouraged everyone who listens. And I have to tell you all, I love this specific teaching. I think it really places things into context, not only from a ministry standpoint, but as a way to approach various aspects of life. Dad talks about his early days of ministry, well before I was born, or Dad had even made it to Ponca City where he met my mother Crystal. Now, as always, we would love to hear from you all in any way you like, email, Facebook, Instagram, etc. We love hearing how these messages resonate with you. It is so encouraging to us, and it keeps us energized and keeps us pushing out new episodes and content. So let's get into this introduction of our final episode. Prior to the prophet Elijah's encounter with King Ahab over Naboth's vineyard, he had been walking through an agricultural area in Israel and spotted a young man plowing a field. There were 11 teams of oxen plowing in front of this man, and he was plowing with a 12th team of oxen. The sensitive spirit of the prophet Elijah instantly saw something in this man, so he walked over to the young man and threw his mantle around his shoulders. Elijah would later discover that the name of this man was Elisha, the son of Shaphat. The farmer turned from his team of oxen and said to Elijah, Please let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. Elijah agreed. What Elisha did at this point was fascinating. He kissed his father and mother, then demonstrated his commitment to following Elijah, in that he slaughtered his team of oxen, his sole means of support. Then he set fire to his plow and yoke, his secondary means of support. He proceeded to cook the meat of the oxen and shared it with the people of the village and his family so that they could all enjoy one final meal together. Then he followed Elijah from that point onward, serving him in any way that he possibly could. That is the last that we hear of Elisha for several years. Then he reappears with Elijah at a place called Gilgal, the place where Israel camped upon first entering the promised land. He had seen many things since he had begun to follow Elijah. For one thing, he had been with Elijah when King Ahazah from Israel had sent a captain with 50 men to place Elijah under arrest. He watched as the prophet called down fire from heaven, and those men were utterly consumed. He was also present when the king sent another group of 50 to arrest the prophet. Once again, he heard the prophet call down fire from heaven and saw those men consumed. Then, when another group of 50 came, Elisha heard the captain from the group appeal to the prophet to save his life. No doubt, the young prophet heard the voice of the angel of Yahweh, the pre-existent Christ, to tell Elijah to save this captain and his men and go back to Samaria with this captain to confront the king. This was a dangerous proposition, but Elijah did as he was told. At this point, Elijah was aged. It is time for him to leave this earth, but he has a few things to do before that could occur. For one thing, he would take a quick ministry tour of the area. Then, God would take him. This is the background for Pastor Harris's teaching in this episode. So with that introduction, let's wrap up the Courage and Confrontation series with the 11th and final teaching titled, The Double Portion. Let me let you in on a principle that God has ordained, and it's been in effect from the beginning of time. Now that principle is this. God is doing a progressive thing with his people. And it has always been the will of God for each succeeding generation of believers to do greater things than the generation that went before it. Now let me say it this way. It has never been the will of God for his people to stay where they are. He expects us to constantly move forward further and further into him. We might say that God wants us to do more with David and with Mark and with Jeff's generation than he did with mine. That's just the way God works. Not that God hasn't used my generation. He has. But not as much as he desired to use us. And God still depends on us older guys to carry our weight. You see, at this point, my generation is still crucial Because we know how God wants things to be done, and in most cases, this generation knows how to get them done. But God needs that younger generation because they're dreamers and visionaries. 
they can see clearly what God wants to happen. And not only that, they have the energy to put in effect what they see if they're shown how to do it by the previous generation. And that very same principle was at work in the time of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, you see, represented the older generation, while Elisha represented the younger generation. In fact, I see the relationship between these two prophets as being very similar to the relationship that has existed for years between Craig Rochelle and myself. Now, as most of you know, I mentored him for six years. Then Craig took all the things that I taught him over those six years, and he added to them a fresh revelation, and now he has shaken the entire Christian world. Now he's doing far more than I ever dreamed of doing in my ministry. And now that he is in his mid-40s, he's preparing an even newer generation, and that generation should do greater things than he has done. That's how God has designed it to work. Just look at the relationship that existed between Elijah and Elisha. Just like Craig Groeschel took the things I taught him and is doing greater things than I ever dreamed of doing, Elisha would do the same thing. He would take what Elijah had taught him, and he would do spectacular achievements. The Bible is clear about this. But now, don't, don't you dare get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that Elisha did better works, better works than Elijah did. That was not the case. He just did more of them. You see, Elijah is accredited in the Old Testament with doing 16 miracles. Did you know that? 16 major miracles. Elisha, on the other hand, is credited with doing 32 major miracles. Exactly two times as many. So Elijah was involved in twice as many as his mentor was. And that is what I mean when I say that Elisha did greater works than Elijah. Remember now, Jesus once said this to his disciples. Remember, the works I do, you do also. Now listen, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go into my Father. In other words, Jesus makes my point. He says that his disciples would do more mighty works More mighty things than he had ever done, just as Elisha did more mighty things than Elijah. But you say, Pastor, how is that even remotely possible? How could these 12 simple men do greater works than the Lord Jesus Christ? It seems incredible, doesn't it? After all, Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God. He was God in human flesh. How could these 12 ordinary men do greater works than he had done? Ask yourself that question. How is it possible? How could it happen? Well, I can tell you. There were three basic reasons. For one thing, Jesus was only one man. But there were 12 of his disciples. And 12 men can always do 12 times as much as one man, right? And within days, those 12 men had multiplied to 120. And a couple of days after that, they had multiplied to 5,000. And then they would multiplied to countless millions. And that is one reason why we are able today to do greater things than him, because there are so many of us. And for a second thing, Jesus now sits at his father's right hand, interceding in behalf of his disciples. He is the divine interceder. That's another reason why his followers were able to do greater things. And thirdly and finally, they could do greater things because of this. When Jesus ascended into heaven, what did he do? He sent the Holy Spirit to abide within his followers. God in them, doing God's work through them. No wonder they could do great works. And that would be true of Elijah as well. This man knew. Now, he knew some things. And what are the things he knew was that the generation of Elijah was quickly passing away. And it appears to me that God had shown the ancient prophet that when his generation was gone, there was going to be a radical shift in the way God would deal with the world. God would begin to reveal himself in greater power and in a greater anointing. 
than the world had ever seen before. The world had never seen anything like it was going to see when Elisha ben Shalphat stepped on the scene. God would begin to do mighty things. And Elijah knew that it would require great power for him to do the greater things that Elijah had done. He couldn't have ordinary power. He was provoked to have great power if he was going to do great things, don't you think? Now, if we examine the text carefully, we'll notice that in 2 Kings 2, Elijah takes Elijah to two different towns. The towns of Bethel and the towns and the town of Jericho. Now, in each place, Elijah makes a rather stunning suggestion. He says, Elijah, my boy, there is a school of prophets here. You can go to seminary in this place. So why don't you choose to stay here and let me go on my way? But both times that he made this suggestion, once in Bethel, once in Jericho, Both times, Elijah shakes his head and says, absolutely not, refused to stay, and followed his teacher. He even used what is known as a double oath, as an indication of his bulldog determination to stay with his teacher to the very end. In fact, he says this, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. I'm with you in this thing. So, Why did Elijah suggest that Elijah stay in these places if he didn't really want him to do so? Well, I think it was a test. I think it was a test to prove that Elijah was made of good stuff, stuff that could be counted on, that he would be there no matter what. He would stay to the bitter end. And I think that is exactly what it was about. And Elijah passed the test. Now, let me tell you why I think Elijah continued to remain with his mentor. I think he stayed close to his mentor because he knew that this grizzled old man knew more about walking in the power of God than anyone else on the face of this earth. If he wanted to find a better man of God, he couldn't have. This was the greatest man alive. And he was determined to learn everything this man knew. In other words, what set this young man, Elisha, apart was this. He had a teachable spirit. I want to be taught. I would rather be taught by the master than be taught by a bunch of other prophets. I want to hear from a true man of God. I want to follow this man. Now, teachable people are the only kind of people that God can really use. If you don't have a teachable spirit, God can't use you mightily. In fact, God cannot use any of us until he can teach us. And that was why Elijah was determined to remain close to this man. He wanted to learn so he could be used of God. Now, I want you to be aware of one thing. Elisha's role was not very glamorous at that point in time. You see, he was known as Elijah's servant. In other words, he followed the great man around doing anything and everything the great man wanted done. That's not very glamorous, is it? He wasn't preaching any crusades. He wasn't healing any sick people. What he was doing was following a guy around playing water boy. That was his role. At this point, let me tell you something you may not know. The men that God would use most mightily, men like Paul and Peter, addressed themselves in their various epistles as being the douloi. Of Christ. See this word douloi? Douloi. What does it mean? It means bond slaves. Someone who is owned by someone else. These two men said, I'm not my own. I am owned by the Lord Jesus Christ. I am his slave. And that was the role of Elijah. He was a bond slave. He bore that title with great honor. And this is what we are called to be. Do you know that? Every person in this chapel is called to be a douloi. And God will never use us until we're willing to accept that role. You see, we Christians are called to a life of servanthood. 
We are called to a life of servanthood. But in the modern church, we don't have many servants left. The church is in desperate need of persons who are genuinely willing to serve the needs of others around them. And it's only those kinds of people that God will give the mantle of leadership. Now, I realize that this role of leadership stands in stark contrast to what we see in the church today. I know a lot of young pastors entering the ministry. I've had a lot go in uh, under my ministry. And as I see it, young pastors entering the ministry today all want to be Craig Groeschel. I'm not kidding you. It's the truth. They say it to me to my face. I want to be Craig Groeschel. I want to pastor a life church. But let me let you in on a little secret. There's only one Craig Groeschel. He is a unique gift to the church. And ministry, the regular, ordinary ministry... Now, Jeff, I'm going to warn you of this so that you don't come back to me and say, Pastor, you didn't tell me. Most ministry is more an expression of my experience than Craig's experience. You see, as all of you know, I started my ministry in tiny Carmen, Oklahoma, with 22 people. And there, God shaped me into a man that he could use. He found out what I was made of. He determined whether or not I was teachable. And believe me, there were times I resisted being teachable. I had my struggle. Oh, I'll never forget. I've told you this before, but it's worth telling again. I just got so sick and tired of three people in that church. I got to where I couldn't even bear to see. I described them as being one jackass and two old biddies. I finally got my fill of them, and I called my district superintendent, Dr. Lemuel Finn. I said, Lem, I need to come see you. He said, sure, drive on over. So I drove to, to Enid, sat down in his study with him, and I said, I want to move. He said, really? Where do you want to move to? I said, how about Drummond? He said, well, why, first of all, tell me why you want to move. I said, I've got this one jackass and these two old biddies. They're just driving me crazy. He said, do you think there's no jackasses and no biddies in Drummond? I hadn't thought of that. But then he said to me, Nick, I'm not going to move you. I wouldn't move you for anything. And I said, why not? He said, because you need those people. I looked at him and I said, look, I need them like I need a hole in my head. Another one. Dr. Finn said, no, you need them. Because he said, let me tell you what the church is. The church, according to St. Peter, is a bunch of moving stones. And you have to be shaped to fit your place. And that requires having your corners knocked off. He said, when stones move around, that's what happens. You get your corners, your sharp edges knocked off. And he said, those people are knocking off your corners. Do you know, I sat there and I looked at this man and because I admired him so much and because I thought he was such a great man of God, I received his words and I went home and I said, God, I'm going to be content in whatsoever state I'm in. You've placed me in Carmen, Oklahoma and I'm staying here and I'm going to minister to those people and I'm going to love that jackass and those two old biddies. Turned out to be three of the best friends I ever had. They helped to shape me into the man I became. You've got to have a teachable spirit. You've got to listen to the wisdom of that other generation. I was teachable, and because of that, God shaped me. And that was true of Elijah as well. God's priorities, not his own, came to control his life. And throughout his lifetime, he would not allow himself to be ruled by the desires of his physical body. He would not submit to the things that would get him off course and make him unavailable to God. I remember another time. Well, let me tell you this first. When I was on my way, when I was told where my first appointment was going to be, Carmen, the first thing you want to do, if you're, if you're a minister, you want to drive and see your new church. Now, I take off, drive through Ponca City, 
never knowing I would pastor there, through Tonkawa and through Lamont. And I can remember driving through that town and saying to myself, if this was the last place in the United States of America to pastor, I would not come to this place. This is the gosh awfulest, ugliest town I have ever seen. These people have no pride. They won't even sweep their streets. And boy, I went off and I'm just going down the road just blaspheming those people something horrid. I wouldn't go here. God, I'm so glad you didn't send me here. I'm above this. I get a call. From Dr. Finn, again, he said, Nick, the bishop has decided he's going to move you. I said, oh, really? I said, to where? He said, have you ever been to Lamont, Oklahoma? I said, yes, I have. He said that that's where he wants you to go. And I said, is there nowhere else? He said, no, we've consulted God about this, and we feel like this is where you need to be. Old smart aleck opens his stupid mouth and says a bunch of stupid stuff, and God says, I'll show you. Had one of the best pastors I've ever had in that little old one-horse dirty town. Learned to love that place. Realized the wisdom of my mentor. Well, one day I get a telephone call from OCU. They had a job for me. They wanted to offer me the position of chancellor of the chapel. And it paid twice as much as I was making. And it's when you're starving to death, that sounds like a pretty good deal. (laughs) And so I thought, I said, well, I I will think about it. And so just as soon as I hung up with with the president of the college, I called Dr. Finn. And I said to him, Lim, I've been offered this position. What do you think? Don't you dare take that position. I'm going to tell you something. God has gifted you spectacularly, and you'll waste yourself if you ever go into some institutional job. You get as far away from that as you can. Well, listen, when you're hungry, that looked pretty good. But I'm going to tell you something. I had learned my lesson that I had the voice of wisdom to listen to. And if I was smart, I would listen to that man from that other generation who knew far more than I knew. Elijah was that way too. In New Testament parlance, Elijah was a spirit-controlled man. His attitude was like that of the Apostle Paul. Now listen to the words of Paul in the book of Philippians, the epistle to the Philippians, chapter 3, verse 12. It says, not that I have already attained. He said, look. I haven't even begun to get where I plan to go. I'm not attained or am already perfected. He said, there is nothing perfect about me. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. Then he says, but I press on. I keep going that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. See, that is an Elisha attitude. Let's be clear about this. Elisha, like Paul, knew that he wasn't perfect. He had a lot to learn, and he had to learn it quickly. Why? Because he knew that Elijah was going away soon. He didn't know how Elijah would go away. He probably thought Elijah would die, right? But whatever it was, he was determined to be there when it occurred. Now, let me digress for a moment. In the city of Jericho, as I said a moment ago, there was a place, a seminary, that was called the School of the Prophets. And because these men were were prophets, now, they had some, obviously had some gifts. And it had been revealed to them that Elijah was not going to be here very much longer. They also knew this. God had shown it to them. So when Elijah and Elisha left the town of Jericho, these students followed from a distance. They wanted to see the great man when he passed away so they can say, man, I was there when it happened. Yeah. And, you know, I'd have been right in the middle of them. I'd have been one of those. I wouldn't have got too close because if it was going to be lightning from heaven, I wouldn't want to be one of those devout. Right? They followed Elijah and Elisha at a distance as they approached the flood swollen Jordan River. 
And now Elisha would learn what a man of God does when he comes to a flooded river. You know what he did? Took his mantle from off his shoulders, doubled it up, grabbed it by the end, slapped the waters with it, and the waters just divided in half. And the two prophets walked across. I'm not kidding you. This is not a lie. He slapped the waters. The waters stacked up, and they crossed across the Jordan on dry land. Now, let me ask you, is there a better example of an inward and outward exercise of faith than Elijah manifested? What's going to happen if you slap the water with your mantle? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Leave it to Jimmy. He's always got a good one here. Now, beloved, this was a man who knew how to operate in the power of God. And Elijah wanted to learn how to operate in that power. He was watching Elijah. He wanted, and God wants to do the same thing. See, God wants to enable you and me to do exceeding abundantly more than we think or ask. Well, while Elijah was analyzing what he had just experienced, the water stacking up and walking across to the other side, something incredible, something mind-boggling happened. Now, if you think this has been absolutely unbelievable up to now, forget everything you've ever seen or heard. Elijah suddenly turned to Elisha and said this to him, What may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Now, here's the amazing thing about Elisha. He was prepared with an answer. I just said, well, let me think about it there, too. Not him. He said, please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Elisha responded by saying something very odd. He said, you have asked for a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. And even as Elijah was speaking... A chariot of fire with horses of fire appeared in the heavens and separated Elijah from Elisha. And the text then goes on to say this. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now, don't you think Elijah was stunned? I mean, I think he got drop jaw and had it for a couple of hours. I mean... Chariots and horses of fire. I mean, this is mind-boggling. I think I'd have been stunned. So what did he do? He took hold of his clothes and he tore them into pieces. Then he picked up Elijah's mammal off the ground. It's a funny thing. Elijah happened to drop it. He put it on his own shoulders and he walked back to the Jordan. Now, the issue became this. What did he ask for? He had asked for a double portion of Elijah's power and anointing. Now, the question had to be, don't you think? He picks it up. He puts it on his shoulders. Now, it's easy to put on a mantle that belongs to somebody else. The question is, do you have the double portion of the power? So what does he do? He reaches the river, takes the mantle off, doubles it up, and slaps the water. And the water separates before him, and he walks across. Now he knew. The power, the anointing was his. He knew it, and so did all the prophets from the school of the prophets who were watching from a distance. How quickly do you think the word spread through the nation? There is a new man on the scene. God has picked a man and given to him an outpouring of his spirit. Now listen. God is no respecter of person. He wants us all to have a fresh anointing of power. He wants us to do greater things than we've seen done before. Jeff, for you of this new generation of ministers, God expects twice as much from you. 
as He did for me, because in reality, we're two generations removed. But God is calling. And you know what I've seen in Jeff's generation? These young men who are entering the ministry that I've seen in this chapel are serious about their callings. It isn't a profession to them. It's a calling. Jeff, fight the good fight, my friend. And whatever anointing God has bestowed upon me, I bestow upon you. And upon David and upon Mark. And upon the other young men that God is using. In chapel, we're like the school of the prophets. It's up to us to support to pray, to enable, to lift, to encourage the next generation of ministers. Because without them, the church will indeed die. Well, that's my teaching for today. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. If you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe too. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Don't forget to connect with Ariel Ministries on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe to our email list at arielministries.com. That's Ariel spelled A-R-I-E-L. We look forward to keeping you updated on upcoming episodes and projects. If you would like to support the missional efforts of Ariel Ministries in Thoraka, Kenya with Each One Feed One, We'd like to remind you that 10% of all donations to Aerial Ministries will support this missional effort. Visit aerialministries.com slash give for online donations and other methods of giving. To learn more about the Thoraka mission, you can visit aerialministries.com slash missions. You can also listen to episode 26 for a deeper dive into how our relationship with Each One Feed One and the McCarter family started over 35 years ago, where we are today, and where we're headed in the future. 